Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 784. I am Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 27th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. Before we get too far into the program, please like us on Facebook and YouTube. That helps with the algorithms and make us more popular uh, in the Anglican and Christian world. We appreciate that very much. It's it's free advertising. That's all you're, you're donating when you click that like button. We appreciate it. The show continues in the comments. Every week we get more and more comments. You guys are paying more attention to the show and expressing your opinions in the comments. We really appreciate that. And you're giving us more and more hints. If you have hints on stories you want to send us, please send it to anglicantv at gmail.com and we'll investigate it and see if it's something for the show. George, how are you doing this week? I've been kept very busy by the news. Uh, coming out uh, of England, it's uh, we could have a five-hour show if we're not careful. <laughs> yeah, well, buckle your seatbelts. Well, you were doing some work in your garage. You told me. Well, yes, uh, I had to replace the wall. I had to replace some piping for the hot water heater. I did that last month, uh, but my wife wouldn't let me use uh, my blowtorch to uh, sweat the fittings together because she was afraid that I would blow up the house because we have gas lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I had to use these push connect fittings, and of course they work, but when they don't work, they really don't work, and you have to take everything apart and do it all over again. So I convinced her to let me turn off the gas at the street, make bleed out all the lines, and then play with my blowtorch to my heart's content. And the house hasn't blown up since, so I, I must be doing something right. And I didn't See. burn myself, but I have to wear a back brace today because I woke up in such, oh, I'm getting old. Yeah, well, you're different. You're you're brave enough to take on projects. I'm brave enough to buy the tool for the project, but I'm not brave enough to drill a hole in the top of my RV for a new antenna or something. I usually call the RV guy. I have a guy. He he lives uh, near us here at the Florida Grand, and when I call him, he will let me know whether what I want what I want to do is smart or stupid. It's normally stupid, and whether or not he will do it and how much it will cost. Uh, God has at, at this time in my life given me more. Uh, money than time and so I will pay a guy to do what you're willing to do and and sacrifice on your own I'm like no last time we sold our house it had 17 years of delayed maintenance and that was my fault George let's move on to the news all right as George indicated in the uh, uh, promo here we have a lot of news I have Church of England and the response to LLF and I have five subcategories to that you guys if you don't want to hear anything on the church of england and the living love and faith document just tune out right now forward about 35 minutes 45 minutes just go to the next episode because this is going to be a lot of talk about uh people responding to the llf and let's if if this is your first show in like five weeks let's tell them what the llf is george Living in Love and Faith has been the multi-year project to chart the church's way forward on homosexual issues. Mm-hmm. Um, at our last show, filmed a week ago, Friday, while we were filming, the Church of England was giving its presentation on LLF. Mm-hmm. The paper had been re- released by the House of Bishops the previous Wednesday, and we already had comments of outrage uh, from the left and from the right. Uh, Gafcon denounced it swiftly and strongly Mm -hmm. and then we had about two dozen three dozen bishops in the church of england say how wonderful this is then we start with the press release a press conference of last week at the press conference justin welby introduced it and gave a little presentation as did a member of the llf commission and welby was asked a question uh, what will you do and justin welby said well i endorse and support this process but i'm not going to do any gay blessings myself. I will not not conduct the blessings, yes. And he was asked, well, why not? Don't you agree with it? Yes, I agree with it, but I need to be a source of unity for the Anglican communion, and this will upset the globe, the wider church. He's half right. It has upset the wider church, but he's not going to be, his his personal reservations will not... uh, keep him in the spot as first among equals. Mm -hmm. 
No, he, it's not for, he's not persuading anybody, George. And Sarah Mullally was asked a question, uh, essentially, uh, so when was gay sex now good or bad or what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And Sarah Mullally said that, you know, a homosexual must no longer be chaste in order to lead a godly or holy life. If they have a same-sex relationship that is committed and loving and not exploitative, uh, then they are uh, within uh, God's... Uh, understanding of definition of holiness of of which of course is thrown out 2000 years of church teaching universal church teaching and the church of england is going to drop its old uh rules which said that sexual relations are properly between man and wife and marriage for life that's what it says at the lambeth conference document 110 from 1998 and now uh, that's not so. And then they're making the distinction between holy marriage and holy matrimony. Evidently, we didn't know this all these years, but holy matrimony is, is what the church does and marriage is what the state does. I don't remember that being how it works. Uh, yeah, if, I, if you go back to Genesis, it's what God does. If you go back to the teachings of Christ, it's what God does. Uh, so, all right. So we're going to, like always, the church turns over the important things. Uh, uh, now we're turning over marriage to the, the government. Pretty crazy. So that was Friday. Mm -hmm. and then we had the responses follow. We had... Uh, liberal outrage, the campaign for equal marriage, uh, all the different gay groups, this wasn't enough. This was still treating gays and lesbians as second-class citizens within the life of the church. They did not buy the, distinguish, the distinction between marriage and holy matrimony. They felt they were being patronized. They felt they were being handed something that was second best. And on Monday night, a group of about 40 plus people led by Jane Ozan and Peter Tatchell, the noted activist, did a little picket outside of Lambeth Palace demanding that the Church of England go all the way. Justin Welby put on a woolly hat and a parka and went out to talk to them. And he told them the truth. And the truth was that it would require a two thirds majority in both the clergy and lay orders of General Synod to have this happen, and that is not going to happen because those numbers are nowhere near there. Well, they pressed him further and they demanded that he crack down on any clergy offering conversion therapy, meaning prayers for people who are afflicted by unwanted same-sex desires, uh, which the Church of England now says is wrong to pray for people like that. And well, we promised to crack down and Jane Ozan has told her supporters, find, let's name and shame all priests who pray for people in this situation. So all the ex-gay ministries, all the oh, people gosh. who have pastoral concerns, they're going to be reported to Justin Welby and Welby I, will take action. I can think of eight, maybe nine ex or post uh, uh, gay priests within the Church of England. Um, what, what are they going to lose their jobs? Are they going to be canceled? It, does the LLF allow for them to be canceled now because they have successful ministries uh, and have themselves been converted? What do you do, George? Ah, well, you pray for them. I don't yes. know if that, I don't know oh, if, if we you, pray for people who pray, whether we're now, we now have the cooties that allow Justin Welby to come after us as well. I think, well, he doesn't like us, but yeah, there, there's the paradox, right? Yeah. And then, then the conservatives pushed back. We had a number of papers by Ian Paul, Lee Gaddis, Martin Davey, uh, the Church of England Evangelical Council had responses, all basically saying this is intolerable, this cannot stand, this is wrong, this is, there's no scripture, there's no theology, there's no... There's no reason. There's yeah, nothing here. This tradition. is a political document. Yeah. They'd, and... They don't even make an attempt to justify this through reference to the Bible or reference to the church traditions. 
we have had some conservative bishops in the Church of England raise their head above the trenches. Uh, James Manukum, the Bishop of Carlisle, and his su suffragan, the Bishop of Penrith, put out a pastoral letter to their diocese saying, we support traditional marriage, but let's just see how this thing plays out. So we have had quiet conservative comments, but nowhere near the two or three dozen euphoric statements like the, the Bishop of Bristol or the Bishop of Gloucester or the Bishop of Oxford. <clears throat> so, and then we have members of parliament getting up and putting in their two cents, saying, since it's a state church, we feel they should do what we say. And, you know, we think that gay marriage is right and true and good and the Church of England must do this. So we've got political pressures. Um, well, I think the biggest pressure is this is all happening in the vacuum of wokeness and all in the vacuum of the cancel culture. Justin uh, Welby does not want to be canceled. He doesn't want the Church of England to be canceled. He want canceled. He wants them to still be relevant in 2023. And ironically, you can't be relevant if you are the same entity as the culture you're trying to serve. And Justin Welby is 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 he's so contradictory. We cannot pray. You cannot pray to change someone's sexual orientation. But Welby uh, two weeks ago said it's okay to help someone change their gender. So we can pray for people to become a man if they're a woman, or if a woman they become a man. But if they are attracted to a person of the same gender, we can't pray for them in those cases. Mm -hmm. You know, t tell me, where's the ration? Where's the logic? Where's the reason? How can you be pro-transgender pro and reject conversion therapy? You basically, you're rejecting, uh, you're rejecting the psychology counseling. Well, you're whole rejecting God's creation. Realm. You're, you're rejecting creation. And this person was created to be a certain sex to serve godly in, in that creation, to be righteous and holy in that creation. And uh, once influenced by social media and Instagram and people around them, peer pressure, they start to doubt that, that their gender, you need to be there to reinforce the gender. Oh, that's all New Testament, by the way. You need to be there to reinforce their gender and to, uh, you know, lead them down a godly path, a righteous path, to be transformed by the message so, of Christ. Yeah. You know? So the so the other thing that's been sh that's happening, and this is still we're all still within the England now. We've not even yeah. gone overseas yet. Is how little consequence the thoughts of the bishops are of the Church of England in reading these comments from the secular press and from observers and just watching a few bits on English television from time to time, the answer is, well, who cares what the Church of England says on this issue? The, the, they're being shown up for being weak and ineffective and people see it for what it is, pandering to the mob. The Church of England is not standing on any truth it's standing on two different truths when it on its transgender point and on its uh, conversion therapy point. They're two different horses going in different directions. They're standing on both simultaneously, and people see that. But there's no mob. Forty people showed up. That's not a mob. That's coffee hour at my church. You know, I I, I can't. I don't see how we we can say that there's a mob willing to tear down the Church of England. There's not. Uh, Justin Welby is in no chance he's going to be martyred as a Christian. Yeah. I used to tease and say Justin Welby reminded me of Fredo, the weak brother from The Godfather. And that's giving him too much credit. At the, I think uh, both have receiving hairlines, both have weak chins. <laughs> but now I'm more and more reminded of the old uh, TV series Father Ted, where we've basically have moving into farce territory, not tragedy, but farce, where Father, T you know, Father Ted and Justin Welby have, if you will, the same gravitas. Now, I, I'm being silly con comparing a very well-loved TV character with a semi-fictional archbishop, but 
it's the Church of England's mess is of its own making. This is just a PR disaster. You know, from my perspective, this is a PR disaster of the first order. You're shown to be weak, indecisive, pleasing nobody, and standing for nothing other than institutional preservation. And we haven't even gotten to the real important Anglican responses yet, Kevin. No, no. I, and you, you're talking about uh, the Godfather. I'm thinking Scarface. I'm thinking when he, they're down in, in, I forget what the country, making a deal with the devil. Tony Montana's right there. And his the, the guy there was freaking out. You're trying to make a deal with the devil. This isn't going to work. And don't worry about it. Do, you negotiate it for Frank Lopez? Huh? Is that what don't you're doing? Don't worry about it, man. Take it easy. I'm not worried about it. You should worry about it. If he wants to make a deal, it's up to him, not you. We're going to do this one deal. That's it. Okay. Nothing's going to happen. Oh, my. Now we have the response from outside the Church of England, George. Yes, the, uh, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans have said, say hello to my little friend, which yes. is a uh, Scarface <laughs> reference. It's, yes. They've brought out the heavy machine guns, mm -hmm. and they say, okay, Justin, we've warned you once. We're warning you now a second time. If you go down mm -hmm. this road, you will lose the Anglican communion. Mm-hmm. We the next time we primates get together, if you English have uh, put together gay blessings, and are still continuing this farce that a matrimony is not marriage and marriage is not holy matrimony, we will select a new first among equals for the archbishops of the world, and you will just be the head of the Church of England. You uh, of no more importance in the world scheme than the Archbishop of York or the Archbishop of Bangladesh, and they the mean it. Church. Uh, no, well, the Episcopal Church. Well, the Episcopal Church has more money, so that's yeah. always be more important. But I, but, th the the perfect thing to do is right after they have their uh, House of Bishops Synod uh, is next month, right in February, is right after they conclude is to announce a new primates gathering, uh, led by the Global South, and hopefully they get the money uh, together by then to uh, have the tickets paid for, the hotels paid for. And just gather all the primates who want to go to a nice place to it's winter, enjoy the sun, and have a meeting and put together a little agenda, and see see where we go from there, George. You know, my parish hall, Kevin, could comfortably uh, accommodate Absolutely. all the primates, and we have a lovely kitchen, and there's a uh, oh, what are they called? A Hilton Garden Inn down the road. Is you got that, that? And, and you're just a short drive. You can go swim with the mantises. Uh, uh, for your little break, that it's a perfect thing to do to bring the primates in, yeah. and they can golf to their heart's content. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. but so, that, well, the global South primates have basically laid down the law, and then we've had other people not really affiliated with these groups. Gafcon, which basically said the same thing, uh, Uganda said they would break completely with the Church of England if they went down this last uh, down this road. Mm -hmm. The David Parsons, the Bishop of the Arctic, the largest geographic diocese, I believe, in the Anglican world, um, he and his suffragans said, this will not stand. This is unchristian. We stand upon the Bible. We stand upon the, 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 uh, the traditions of the church. And we stand upon logic and reason. And the solution being put forward by the Church of England corresponds to none of these. So, and so the Arctic is not self-funding. It relies on money from Canada, it relies on money from mission societies in England and Ireland and mm -hmm. all these different places. And they're basically willing to stand upon the truth, come what may. And just contrast David Parsons' courage in this battle against the Archbishop of Canterbury. So, oh, and now oh, about the, the lawyers. Archbishop, oh, the lawyers, the uh, lawyers put out, the Church of England just published uh, a, a supplemental document for the Synod where they have the legal opinion saying that there is a distinction in English law between holy matrimony and marriage. And they refer to uh, some of the uh, civil partnership acts and this and that. And saying, yes, it's the, don't worry, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. And the Church of England's uh, uh, 
put out a press release unsigned saying, don't worry, guys, it's all okay. The lawyers tell us it's just fine. Don't worry about it. And the ACC, Anglican Consultative Council, put out a stupid paper saying, well, you, no one church can tell another church what to do. Except, of course, if it's the Church of England, and then they can tell all the little black and brown churches all around the world. Oh, they what want. To do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just ask the just ask them about uh, you know Justin Welby getting all hot and bothered about. Oh, you have laws in the books that make sodomy criminal and all this and that. Uh, yeah, of course, Church of England can tell others what to do, but nobody can tell the Church of England what to do. So here's where we stand. The uh, general Synod is coming up. Then we have the GAFCON meeting. Uh, Global South is probably going to meet later in the year as a group. And when the next primates meet, if they go through with this, Justin Welby, out the door you go. Bye. It's been fun. Well, you know, people people in the British press say he's just hanging on so we can crown King Charles the Third. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all that matters. And then once he's done that, boom, he's just coast until he hits retirement and has maxed out his pension. <sighs> all right. Let's move to other news. I wish we could get out of Britain, but we're going to still stick around there. Uh, Enoch Burke was fired. We've not really talked about his uh, situation uh, over in Ireland. He was a school teacher. He, would, he refused to bow to the woke supremacist who said you have to uh, identify people by their preferred gender. He did not do so. He was uh, told by the school, you're suspended. He came back from suspension. There was then a court order saying you can't come back from suspension. He came back anyway, and he went to jail because he would not bow to wokeness, George. That's crazy. Yeah. Enoch, and this is in the Republic of Ireland, not uh, Westmeath, I think. Uh, Wilson's Hospital School. It's a church, It's a private school owned and operated and run by the Church of Ireland. Burke was a German and history teacher, and he had a student who wanted him to use these made-up pronouns, G and Joe and Jai, whatever. I don't know what they are. They're nonsense. Or refer to the child in the plural as a they, not a... Uh, a he or she, but a they. In that case, it should be an it, logically and grammatically, but. Burke refused. The school said, you have to do it. Burke said, no, I won't. The school said, fine, you're suspended. Burke said, fine, I'm going to come to work anyway. And as Kevin said, he came to work. The school decided, in a good Episcopal tradition, to hire a lawyer and got a restraining order. Burke broke the restraining order. And he was brought before the judge, and he was jailed for contempt. And Burke stayed in prison for 108 days. He refused to back down. Finally, the judge released him before Christmas, saying, this is a PR disaster, and this guy is not going to change his mind. He's he's enjoying being martyred. So they let him out of prison. Well, Burke was finally fired on Friday of last week by the school. And now the teachers unions of Ireland are getting involved saying, you know, there's a legal process for firing a teacher for misconduct. Now, Burke never paid his dues. He's not a union member. So the schools, the union may or may not come in, but they're starting to make noise. But who's been silent through this is the Church of Ireland. Who has been silent is the local hierarchy on the issue of transgenderism, on the issue of these made up pronouns. See, Enoch Burke is in a small way a Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson, of course, world famous psychologist, thinker, or author, one of the most influential men alive today, I would argue. Mm-hmm. When at the University of Toronto, they tried to discipline him for not using these made up pronouns. And Jordan Peterson said, I will stand and I will face the consequences. And he is so articulate and such a brilliant man, he basically was able to break the woke stranglehold. Enoch Burke is not Jordan Peterson, none of us are. And he did not have the platform that Jordan Peterson has, and he has suffered and has been martyred on the altar of political correctness. And the Church of Ireland is nowhere to be seen. Oh, well, well. No, they support they support the imprisonment of Enoch. 
how dare he uh, come against culture? Uh, the woke Church of England is like, oof, at least we don't have to have Justin Welby come down on him. Let the courts do it. You know, and in reading social media from Church of Ireland people, they're basically frustrated. Can't this Pratt just disappear? He's embarrassing us. Why is this guy making a stand for this sort of righteousness? I mean, it's, you know, he, he and he's being pilloried as some sort of 16th century Irish Puritan who's come back to life in the 21st century Church of Ireland. Well, the man shows he has character, and he may be you know, not the most suave and sophisticated of fellow, uh, but he's standing for truth. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had leaders of our church in America, in Ireland, in England, in Africa, who would stand on the gospel the way Enoch Burke is? Because his, his objections are religious and philosophical. You may not compel my speech. You may not control my thoughts. I will not play your thought crime games. Yeah. And this is it. This is this is the ultimate thought crime. I'm going to create a fictional situation with fictional names and fictional genders, and I'm going to force you to acknowledge it. If you do not acknowledge it, you are committing a crime. If that's not the fourth chapter of 1984... I mean, in fifth chapter, and so if that's not 1984, I don't know what is, you know. And it's it's crazy. I I you know hope that people wake up and realize it. And I hope he wins with the unions and uh, that he sues uh, the school and wins. He, this is ridiculous. Uh, in America, he could probably sue and win because we still have freedom of speech that's different than the freedom of speech they offer in in Britain and England. So I don't know about Ireland's freedom of speech. Well. So. Certainly, there have been notable court cases with public school teachers who are being disciplined on these points. Yeah. I can't recall, though, if any private schools have gone down this route. I just don't know. Just if you know about the freedom of speech laws in Ireland, could you do a comment section and let us know if he would have a case if he tried to sue the school? Uh, that would be an interesting thing to learn. Moving on to more news, George, going to the template. Uh, we're getting along here pretty quick. Pakistan. I know we never talk about Pakistan, but there's a church of Pakistan uh, with Anglican connections because of the Anglican Church of Pakistan. And they are half Gafcon, half not Gafcon, depending upon the primate. And so we should talk about this because we got letters from both sides uh, this week saying one says we had a wonderful consecration one says there was an illegal consecration that shall not stand what is the story in pakistan george well in 71 i think it was 71 uh the protestant churches of pakistan essentially got together the presbyterians lutherans methodists anglicans to form the united church of pakistan so it's a united church uh, but it has grown more anglican in its control of the power of the bishop but less anglican in its theologies i don't know how that works they get the they take the worst parts of anglicanism and the worst parts of being uh presbyterian and they go down those paths but okay the diocese of lahore is one of the big dioceses and the church of pakistan canons say that this the national church must oversee the election process of a new bishop diocese of lahore didn't do that it did it internally and the candidate who was selected, they had three retired bishops, including two retired moderators, uh, Sami Azariah and Alexander Malik, consecrate this new bishop. Azad Marshall, who is the current moderator of the Church of Pakistan, uh, on behalf of the church said, this can't stand. This is violates black letter law of the church about how we do things. Lahore says, so sue us because we're one of the wealthier we're one of the wealthier dioceses and we can basically take our time you and i uh, we've been getting these emails that charge all sorts of financial malfeasance on both sides and frankly uh, I, I, some of it may be true some of it may not be true the church of pakistan has a reputation that it takes a lot of money to become a bishop because you sort of 
pay walking around money like they do in some places you, in the United you, States at election time. You butter your way to the top, correct. Yes. And then you hire all your relatives to church offices and you mm -hmm. basically make a killing out of it. Well, the problem is there are eight dioceses. There are four that are GAFCON leaning, including the one led by the moderator, Azad, Azad Marshall. There are three or more in the Church of England, let's go along, get along, whatever Welby wants, Welby gets. Mm -hmm. And Lahore, I think, is number four. So is Pakistan a member of GAFCON? Well, if this man who's elected and consecrated locally, no, because they're split four to four. If they're able to undo this and get a different Bishop of Lahore, yes, then five to three. Uh, they're in GAFCON. And local issues are far more important than uh, the GAFCON affiliation issues because essentially all of the Church of Pakistan has the same views on sexual morality. It's not that one is pro-gay and one isn't, but rather uh, who are we tied to? Who, you know, who pays the piper? Uh, who uh, who uh, sort of greases the skids for us? There was, as an aside, there was a nonsense story out of the England Communion News Service where the primate of uh, Burundi <laughs> said, we are not leaving. There's social media saying we are. We're not leaving. We love you, England. And the thing is, what's he talking about? Who was saying this? Uh, it's it, it was almost like if I put out a statement saying, I don't beat my wife. Friends, if anybody tells you I beat my wife, if you see any viral videos of me beating my wife, know that I've stopped beating my wife. It's like you're scratching well, something. What is this all about? We're all over social media. I saw nothing that indicated Burundi was going to go the way of Gafgon or the Global South, or had any indications. It's like, I have not virtue signaled properly to the Church of England recently. It's time to do so, you know? Yeah, this, uh, and the thing is, you know, the Anglican Communion News Service put out this little story, but then they offered no link to what, or, you know, how do, what are they talking about? Oh, hold on. So Pac we, have, we, we have slow news days when there's nothing to post. So, you know, a broody story is fine for us. At Pakistan, so essentially Pakistan is a mess. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not going to get any better any sooner. Oh. Well, there's another church that's a mess too. Uh, uh, let's talk about the Church of Peru and uh, the how they're struggling with the politics going down there. I don't know if they, you know this as a casual viewer of Unscripted, but uh, there was a president. president got dis, uh, avowed by... Uh, they're equivalent to Congress and uh, was let out of office. He's fighting to get back into office. And meanwhile, the Church of Peru is sitting there going, what do we do? Yeah, and it's a tough one. Uh, uh -huh. The president was impeached an hour before he was about to dissolve Congress. Uh -huh. uh, this is back in December, and it's been six weeks since then. And the country is falling apart. There's open revolt in the South. And now there are clashes between pro-president and pro-Congress groups in Lima, the capital. Uh, we got a press, we got a long letter from the Bish Anglican bishop in Peru. It was in Spanish, so I had to trying to decipher it. So I want to make sure I get it right before I publish it. But essentially, what he's saying is, we support the democratic process, and the Congress, even though it's not very popular, followed the law. And so we support the institutions of justice, the courts, the Congress, the presidency, and we must follow, be faithful to the Constitution and not fall into being party supporters. And the Anglican statement is also in line with the Roman Catholic statement. So, you know, basically all the churches are saying, we want to be good government. The problem is this has turned into a Indian versus Mestizo revolt. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, the, the Indians, the native, uh, some still speaking Quechua uh, versus the Spanish and the Mestizos, the mixed Indians, mixed Spanish and the acculturated Indians. And in the South, and the thing is the Anglican church does most of its missions work and has most of its members among the native populations, the indigenous populations, and then has a church in Lima uh, for the wealthy sophisticates and the patriots and whatnot. So it's, it's a split church of two characters, 
a chaplaincy in Lima and then work among the poorest of the poor. And the problem is that their bases are being pulled apart because they do all this mission work amongst the indigenous population who backed the president because he was the first Indian, uh, first who fully identifies as being indigenous. There have been mestizo bishop in presidents in the past and so on and so forth. But this is the one who this made one of his issues. So the Bishop of Peru is warning that uh, there's no quick fix on the horizon for this country. And we're seeing the starts, I don't want to call it a race war because it's not a race war, but we're seeing a war that's dividing into oh, tribalism that is not going to go be, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And, you know, what, what should the church do? Uh, you may have terrible. seen, you know, yeah. like tourists who were seeing Machu Picchu found themselves stranded. Uh, Machu Picchu is the historic Inca temples in the mountain, uh, city in the mountains. And uh, militant, Indian militants have blocked all the highways and burnt buses. And so, you know, the Israeli government had, you know, chartered a jet to fly, chartered helicopters to fly into Machu Picchu to pick up Israeli tourists and fly them out of the country. Uh, so... 50 people have died so far in street violence and at murders at roadblocks and uh, things aren't good. All right, next story. Now, I'm in Florida now. You were always in Florida. A long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, there was a pastor in Florida who wanted to burn a Koran. A Florida man, was it? Well, the Florida man it was. And uh, I remember everybody's reaching out to him in the Christian community say, don't do it. It isn't worth the cause. You, you, what you think you're doing is just going to cause an uproar for Americans, especially Americans overseas. It ain't worth it. And finally, he was convinced not to burn a Quran. I'm reading that a Quran was burned in Sweden, and it's had some uh, unintended effects, George. Yes, a Danish politician, Danish. and I was looking up his name on my sheet, Rasmus Paludin, burned a copy of the Quran in front of the Turkish embassy in Stockholm. Uh, Sweden wants to join NATO, and S Turkey has been basically being difficult, demanding all these things from Sweden in order to sign off to allow them to join NATO. Well, Rasmus uh, is a uh, conservative politician, far-right politician, um, and he burned the Quran to be provocative. Well, the Turks, of course, said, okay, Sweden, we're not letting you into NATO because you allowed this to take place. Well, Sweden has freedom of speech. They can't stop somebody from doing this. Well, ISIS then got involved, and on the this happened on the 21st, where Rasmus burned the Quran in Stockholm. We have outrage around the Muslim world, usual stuff. But then uh, ISIS got involved, and on the 25th, a Palestinian man stabbed to death two travelers on a train traveling from Kiel to Hamburg in Germany. And the same day, a Moroccan man attended a church in Algeciras in southern Spain and pulled out a machete and started stabbing people. And he chased the sacristan out in the street and stabbed the sacristan to death with a machete. And both of these were in response to the uh, Quran burning. The people who blew it, who, it was a car bomb in the, the Congo, we reported last week, that killed 20 plus people. Uh, ISIS in Central Africa says, we're going to do it again, and we're going to do it because what a Christian does in Sweden, uh, we're going to take out against the Christians of the Congo, or the Christians of Germany, or the Christians of, of uh, Spain. So in the weakness, in the distraction caused by the uh, Ukraine war, I think the eyes have been taken off the ball with militant Islam, and we've allowed it to sort of catch its breath mm. and come back and uh you know it's creeping back again creeping back again what a great transition to our next story george uh famous baker jack phillips is in the news again this week he has lost an appeal uh in the appeals uh court in colorado to the latest case of somebody suing him for not artistically baking the cake they want him to bake and this really goes back to the thought crime. 
the LGTBQ plus plus community. I hope I got that right. I'm not trying to insult you by not getting it right. I don't do good with acronyms of any size. Um, cannot win any argument unless they can allow for thought crime. And here they are um, having what I call uh, a thought time, a thought crime feast. They have a, a baker who will not simply put on a supporting statement on top of a cake. How evil can he be, George? And it's the second time up and down the course. First time around, it was a gay cake for a gay mm -hmm. wedding, yeah. and he wouldn't do it. He said, you know, hundreds of bakers will do it. Uh, just not something I want to do. Because and he will me, refer you. He, he has the list. He will refer you to the baker who will do it. And he says, you know, for me, cake decorating and baking is an art form. Mm -hmm. And I cannot subordinate my art to your political cause. Well, that went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and he won. Well, the this time around, a transgender activist, a lawyer, asked to have a coming out cake that was pink on the outside and blue on the inside with all this transgender stuff on it. And Baker and Philip, uh, Jack Phillips said, uh, no, thank you. I'm not, I'll refer you to somebody else, but I'm not going to celebrate your coming out with my artistry. And it's gone through the Calif uh, Colorado civil rights and human rights courts and laws. And, and now it's following the same path. And it'll certainly wind up at the U.S. Supreme Court again. And the U.S. Supreme Court will up, doubtless uphold its prior ruling. But essentially, we're, the gay activists and the transgender activists are engaging in lawfare. They're basically trying to sue out of existence those who hold bad thought. Mm -hmm. Wrong thought. It's a crime. Now, in a, if you look at this from the way the Supreme Court does... They say, can we force an artist like Michel Michelangelo to go into the the local satanic uh, temple and and paint for them? Can we compel him to do that? Can we compel Andy Warhol to? Uh, uh, well, he was a practicing Roman Catholic, so I can't use him as an example. But can you compel an artist to do something against their thoughts or will? And here in America, because we have uh, a constitution and a, 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 pl a plethora of amendments, you can't do that, George. Uh, uh, you know, we had, a case, we had a civil case, a civil issue recently here in Florida, where a black conservative... Uh, who's a Fox News commentator, was having friend, lunch with friends in a restaurant in Miami Beach. Yeah, and the uh, restaurant owner heard them talking and asked them to leave because she will not serve black conservative Republicans. You know, this sounds like Bull Connor in the 1950s in Alabama. I won't serve black people in my restaurant. And, you know, I won't serve people for... Uh, there was a, we're seeing, and it's not the right who's doing this. We saw this in Virginia and Richmond, where a uh, pro-life dinner was canceled because the wait waiters and waitresses refused to wait on them. And the, mm -hmm. that's what the owners told them the day of the, the dinner, the testimonial dinner. We're seeing uh, this level of intolerance, uh, refusing to... Uh, wait on people at restaurants if you disagree with you that's okay in the eyes of the left but if you refuse to bake a cake for somebody who wants you to if you're a jewish baker and they want you to put a swastika on it and arbeit mach fry and hitler was right on it you must do that well let's look at the the case now of tyre nichols uh tyre nichols is a resident of memphis and he was beaten to death by five cops this week should be all over the BLM news. You should be seeing protests by the BLM that a black uh, citizen, Tyre Nichols, was beaten by cops. But they have not said a thing because what were those five cops? They were also black cops. And here the hypocrisy is they won't say a word. Black lives don't matter when you're attacked 
uh, by a person of your same, and I'm going to say race, it's not really race, but of your same skin color, George. It's crazy. The, the hypocrisy of the left will, cannot be outdone. It cannot outmatch itself. It tries. All right, looking here to more stories. We've got a couple more to go. Um, the ACNA is now slowly being recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Not only did Benedict uh, give his voice to a Plano conference, but now, uh, ecumenically, the Catholics are starting to meet with the ACNA, George. Wow. This is a this is a quiet thing, but it is a significant thing. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Ecumenical Group met with the Anglican Church in North America's team. This is the first time, to my knowledge, anywhere in the world that the Catholics have reached out to somebody other than official Anglicandom. In, uh, in, in public. I, in you know, public. I, know, I know some private conversations that have been going on at, at the Vatican, ACNA level, but nothing public. So talks with Anglicans in the United States always meant, for the Catholics, talks with the Episcopal Church. Now they're talking to the ACNA as well. So now, did they come to some great concordat and we've solved the problem of justification by faith through grace and works and and uh, penal substitutionary atonement and the place the, the of Marian Mary? Problem. No, 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 no. None of that. None of that was touched. But what this was was a slap in the face of the Episcopal Church, because the Catholic Church is saying you are a historic partner for debate. You've got to move over a bit to one side because we've got somebody else who's covering the same territory as you anglicanism in the united states yeah, and Canada. as a member of the acna i kind of think it's cool you know uh, i'm surprised it hasn't happened sooner but i think it took uh a couple years of uh, michael curry and many years of catherine jeffert Shoy to to prove that there needed to be another voice for the uh, anglicanism here in america and uh, Roman Catholics are coming around, and uh, it kind of shows that, you know, you and I mentioned before that the ACNA and GAFCON ha are developing a bit of maturity here, and I think the Roman mm -hmm. Catholics are seeing that, you know, that they aren't, this isn't a flash in a pan, this is something that uh, they, they may be here for the long term. Speaking of long term, let's transition to the next story. Pope Francis says homosexuality is not a crime, yet it remains a sin. This is an interview he did uh, uh, recently, and it made the papers because they took half that quote and they printed it across the nation and across the world. And there's two parts of the quote, and I don't know if you and I want to get into the theolo theological challenge here, because it's not a challenge, but let's talk a little about the Pope and how he's, he's <laughs> I don't know, he's kind of being a main predictive character in Benedict's uh, I'm Dead book. Well, why would the Pope say this now? And he said nothing new, but of course all the drama around the Church of England on homosexuality mm -hmm. for a secular and a Protestant world would say, ooh, this is something the Pope's reacting to. I don't believe so. I don't believe that's first and foremost in the minds. Um, Francis has a habit, whether it's a good one or a bad one, of talking too much in a conversational manner. He talks to this one Italian journalist, and the journalist then run, writes out these interviews where Francis says all these things, allegedly, and the Vatican has to walk them all back. Well, Francis talked to a reporter from the AP, and he was asked, is homosexuality a crime? And Francis, who famously said, who am I to judge? Well, that's your job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> has now said it's not a crime but it's a sin now of course what was the newspaper headline it's not a crime well it's never been a crime uh, well it may have been well, a no, crime no, in but the no, past societies, but in modern thinking yeah but now in so certain societies throughout history have at times had it as a crime england yes, for certain you know the united states and united states. it was bowers versus hardwick you That's states right. could criminalize uh, mm -hmm. sodomy and so it's been in our lifetime, Kevin, that that's changed. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Francis said it's not a crime, but it remains a sin. The papers ran with it's not a crime, and pe what people read when they read the first line, the headline and the first line of the paper was, what's Francis doing again? That's right. So it's going to cause consternation. But what I really think is going on is that in this past week, two books have come out, one by uh, uh, Archbishop Geschwain, who was uh, Fran uh, Benedict's secretary mm -hmm. and for the last 10, 20 years, and the other, Benedict's posthumous uh, testimony. Yeah, they're both in Italian, and I we've seen snippets in English. But Benedict's book is the most powerful. It's almost like Lenin's testimony saying, don't, whatever you do, don't let Stalin, Stalin follow me. <laughs> well, Benedict wrote extensively about the gay mafia, gay clubs mm -hmm. and seminaries, and his battle essentially with the subculture, the curia, that prevented his reforms of the institution of you know cleaning up the pedophile rings of basically cleaning up the gay cliques the mccarricks and all this and that and so the spotlight within the catholic world is now on the gay mafia the the the, the pink palace people once again and i think that may be driving Francis is speaking on this issue rather than whatever's happening in the Church of England. Well, the Church of England is dealing with the gay mafia in a different way. They're acquiescing. They're saying, well, what, where can we meet in the middle? How do we have some unity with you in this? Um, where uh, Pope Francis, I don't know if he read the book or it's on his bookshelf or it's uh, still on his Amazon uh, checkout list, but uh, uh, it doesn't make Pope Francis look good because Pope Francis is not fighting the fights that Benedict fought uh, at all. Well, Fran on one level you have to be fair because Benedict was an extraordinary intellect mm -hmm. and he had the ability to write these things um, that just were so accessible and also deep and influential. Francis is not the intellect that Benedict is. It's not he's a dumb man or anything, but he's yeah. a product of South America, and he's a bit of a Peronist, where he'll basically say it's two different things to two different people to maintain power. Francis seems to be, from my outsider's perspective, more about power than he is about principle. That's unkind, it's unfair, but that's just my observation. It's an and that's what we do here. And so Francis will say liberal things to liberals and conservative things to conservatives and leave you guessing. And that was this, that's how Peronism works. You know, the, the, the dictator, the caudillo, will basically say one thing to this crowd and another thing to the, uh, to the rich and wealthy and try to get them both on side to maintain his regime. I don't know. It's interesting it led to a nice healthy show for England scripted uh we will be talking obviously more about the church of england uh as they go into synod about the uh living love and faith next week uh i just saw our email we have two more that came while we're recording the show you need to get these out on thursday people if we're going to talk about it uh we'll talk about those on tuesday george you have a wonderful weekend i'm kevin Coulson. and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 784 of Anglican Unscripted.